What is up, beautiful people? Happy Thursday to you. I'm super excited to be talking to our guest, Dr. No Nicole LaPera. With her permission, I'm allowed to call her Nicole. And let's get into the let's get into the deck, Jonah. Who is Dr. Nicole LaPera? She's trained in clinical psychology at Cornell University in the New School, so we know she's very smart already. She's a holistic psychologist. She's founded the Mindful Healing Center in Philadelphia and a recent LA transplant as of February of this year. And her work is works uh, around the connection between the mind and the body. And she's also the creator of the movement, hashtag self healers. What's remarkable about Nicole is this, is that she has a massive following on Instagram, which is how I think uh, uh, Ricky uh, came, um, how he found out about her with 2.3 million followers. This is crazy, this is bananas. So you guys don't know who she is, check her out. Uh, go look her up on Instagram at the holistic psychologist and there's a period between those things but I'm sure you'll be able to find her here's how else you can find out about her she has a website it's your holistic psychologist.com Nicole welcome to the show Woo! Yeah, Nicole. Yeah! Welcome, welcome, thank welcome. you thank you thank you I appreciate you having me Chris thanks so much you know uh, as fans of the show, they know I like to talk to psychologists and psychotherapists because it's mind work. And we talk about this all the time. I can teach you all the tools, but if you don't get the mind right, the tools don't actually ever get used. So there's this thing that I saw you talk about on somebody else's podcast, Melissa Urban's Do The Thing podcast, where you talk about your thing is to teach people to heal and to consciously create a new version of themselves. That's a big idea. What does that mean? Yeah, absolutely. And I guess I want to share first, Chris, that, you know, the idea and the concept of self-healing for me was born out of my own, what I now call my own dark night of the soul, my history of anxiety-based, panic-based symptoms, and essentially all the struggles um, that I was having myself as a human that I was also seeing mirrored in my clients. Uh, back when I had my private practice in Philadelphia, you know, clocking years with people and always kind of finding ourselves, myself and the clients really feeling stuck, mm -hmm. um, not able to create change. So after I had my own breakdown, if you will, um, dove into some research, which was really new for me in really incorporating and highlighting that connection between the mind and the body that was largely left out of my training, I essentially gathered some new tools and began my own journey of beginning to heal myself. Um, and what that means is that's not, this is not me ever speaking out against support and supportive relationships and going to the therapist and getting that level of outside, you know, assistance in our healing. That is part of the journey for many of us. But what I was really beginning to harness is the power of change and the power that we are not harnessing in our own daily lives um, to create that change in our in our kind of overall picture so that's where my journey of self-healing began and then of course somewhere along the way i dove into the whole world that is instagram and social media and started to share these tools and these concepts and pretty much the rest is history and it has been a, a whirlwind journey i would have never imagined it, it taking off as it is but i truly believe that it's resonating for people a lot of us are feeling stuck um, and a lot of us are feeling the need for some extra tools to begin to create the change that is much needed in our lives. Absolutely. And I can't wait for you to share some of those tools with us. And I want to circle back to the whole mind and body thing, because that's a that's a kind of different idea. That's a new idea for me personally. But I, I just want to take a, a brief detour and ask you what motivated you or what prompted you to start sharing your concepts on Instagram? What was that all about? So I. I really two main motivations. Um, if you would have talked to me back when social media was becoming a thing, I was a, a bit hesitant about what it would mean and you know what, what it was myself. Um, so my motivators two years ago, almost at this point now when I went online was twofold. The, the first was I wanted a platform just to be able to begin to speak this truth. Uh, because I hadn't heard anyone talking about this. Like I said, I wasn't learning. I didn't learn any of these concepts in school. So these were new ideas for me. So part of me was wanting to just begin to vocalize the new truth that I was coming to terms with in my own life. And another part of my intention was to possibly find other humans that were going through a similar experience that I am and speaking 
the same truth with them because what I was starting to find in my own healing was a lot of loneliness was that my relationships were really starting to shift and change around me, not necessarily a negative thing, um, but really just highlighting, I think for me, the need to have those and foster those connections. So that was my main motivation. Um, not really going on with any expectation. If I'm honest, Chris, going on with a bit of fear, a hesitancy, um, mainly for what a little less about what would people think, uh, a little more what would my peers think? What would other people in the field that I pretty much knew were also not getting this information in their programs, how would they react to me talking about this new science of epigenetics and the mind and the body being connected and, oh, we can actually you know, create change in our life by doing these practical daily steps. My main concern was what will my peers think? And quite honestly, it's been really overwhelmingly supportive. Cause like I was saying earlier, I think I was speaking to a truth we were all coming to terms with, which was that we were really limited and we were really ill-equipped with the training that many of us received in our, in our schooling. Mm -hmm. And when did your account really gain the traction? It pretty much was so, because community, me fostering, having those connections for myself was so important. I did spend a lot of time cultivating the community right from the beginning. Meaning if you left a comment or you know a message, I was responding pretty much to everyone because that was a main motivation. So I say that to say it picked up like gradually, you know, very early followers would start to you know come get, join the community and then of course along the way i had people with you know platforms already established seeing my work and very graciously offering to have these type of communications and talks with me that you're so graciously having now so each time that happened right i was exposed to now a new community of people that would usually come on and join our self healer movement so a little bit of gradual, definitely a lot of support um, by others in the field and in different fields, really helping this message to spread. Could you put your finger on any one thing that you might have done that catapulted you to this superstar status? Like anybody has a million followers, let alone 2.3 million followers has done something right. I know our audience that are, is a, it's a broad design community. And I just want to spend a little bit of time on this before we move on to the serious stuff. Mm -hmm. The word that comes to mind that I think um, is is responsible for somewhat of is the consistency. Mm -hmm. You know, I made a, a decision for myself. I did a lot of researching of social media. I watched and I observed how other people use platforms. I did a lot of learning about the beast that is social media before I went on. And then I came up with a plan. And like I said, I wanted to be really consistent with my contact content and really consistent with my engagement. So that's what I was. I came up with, say, I was going to post two times a day and I held that commitment to myself, but that also meant responding to everyone. So the consistency of it, I think is what allowed me to gain traction. People knew what to expect. Um, I think also that the content, you know, putting content out there that is so universally resonating and it doesn't have to be so universally resonating. I know a lot of us are doing more niche based work. Um, speaking your truth, this is what I've always uh, kind of aligned myself with the mindset or the belief, put it this way, Chris, of if I show up and speak this truth, I knew on some level, and I still know this, my truth is not going to be for everyone. However, if I just say secure and aligned with my truth, my truth will find the ears of the community or of the collective that needs to hear it at this time. And I just centered myself on that, even when it got hard, and I consistently spoke that truth day in and day out. Um, and I think that is what attributed the success. Mm -hmm. I know initially you said that you were a little hesitant uh, to kind of uh, hear the feedback from your peers. And now that you've done this, what are they saying about you now? Uh, so I get much more, like I said, in support. Um, people who are you know, thankful, have had their own awakenings, are, are using these more holistic tools in their practice already. Because now I get to you know, communicate essentially with the collective at scale. I mean, the universal collective. So hearing that there are other practitioners in the world that have already been doing this work is incredibly motivating. And obviously we're all kind of connecting to each other now in this new way. I won't lie though, there is a population of practitioners who just don't care for my message for many different reasons. Um, and again, my mindset with that is always, you know, allowing people, my message isn't for everyone, you know, right. allowing people to gravitate or take the pieces of anyone's message that resonates with them um, and to leave the rest. So 
yeah, there are some are some critics out there for sure. Um, you know, I just try to stay in my lane and acknowledge and accept that my truth isn't for everyone. Mm. Okay, in case you guys are joining us a little bit late, I'm talking to Dr. Nicola Perra. And originally, she was going to have this conversation with us in the studio. And we had many people who knew about this and secretly sliding into my DM saying, hey, can I be there for the taping of this? So obviously, this is the new reality. You're there in Venice. I'm here in the Pacific Palisades and my team is in Santa Monica. We're making this happen. Now, let's talk a little bit about the connecting the mind and the body. How, how can we apply some of the things that you're teaching and talking about and, and use those principles to help us? Yeah. So the first principle that we have to come to awareness of is just the fact that those two things are connected. Our mind is connected is, I mean, if we really just want to be really simplified about it, it's connect. Our mind is kind of the way I describe our mind, but this way, it's kind of the cognitive faculties of our, our brain, the organ, right? So we all as humans know that the brain is a thing it's in our physical body, but we've lost touch with the fact that you know, th there is a connection, meaning a lot of us are living in dysregulated bodies for many different reasons. Um, the lifestyle choices we're making, what we're eating, what we're not eating. Our nervous system, we now know, plays an incredible role in terms of our body's ability, ability to regulate itself or to re-regulate itself through stress. So with that said, there are many past and current experiences that many of us humans are living that causes that dysregulation in the body. So why do we care? The dysregulated body, because the mind and the body are in communication, sending messages between both, right? Mind to body, body to mind, right? That's going to affect our, our mental wellness. You know, if our body is dysregulated before we know it, we are suffering, you know, those more mental, psychological, quote unquote, if you will, more symptoms. So for me, what this looked like was a lifetime of anxiety. And it wasn't until I began to focus holistically and incorporate some intervent lifestyle based interventions, learn about my nervous system, learn how to regulate my nervous system, that I wasn't able to gain any traction before doing that with my own anxiety. So when I collaborate it and I did work in both areas, my mind and my body, now I'm actually on the other, I wouldn't even identify at this point with some, as someone who has anxiety, as mind blowing as that is, because that was a label, Chris, I had assumed, I would assume for life, that I would always be an anxious person. It depending on how debilitated I was, right, by that anxiety, but I never imagined a future that would be more or less anxiety free and more or less peaceful, which is all I've ever, ever wanted. Um, which is why I'm now so passionate about working holistically and about that concept that you mentioned in the beginning, which was creating a future that's different than the past that many of us have lived, like Groundhog's Day, the same day, the same symptoms, the same issues, day in and day out. I now know, because I've created that level of change in my life, that we can have a future that's different. Hmm. So you were feeling anxious, and that's what it sounded like, and then you made some changes to heal the body, and what, what kind of things did you do? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, anxiety was my backdrop for as long as I can remember. I was a little girl, you know, afraid of the world. My 20s might as well have been one panic attack after another. Um, I've been medicated. I was on the SSRIs. I had the back pocket of clonopin, you know, the benzo to keep my panic attacks, you know, under control. I've sat in many a therapist office. I've laid on many a couch. Um, and again, I thought my conversation was going to be, how do I just manage my anxiety? So that I share that with you because that's all I knew. Um, things really hit a peak uh, several years ago when a, a whole new batch of physical symptoms started to creep up. I started to faint. I started to forget my words mid sentence, not in a normal like, oh, I forgot my thought kind of way, something that actually scared me, that actually had me thinking that something was physically wrong with me. So inspired by, as many of us are, Google and, you know, a desire to diagnose the latest condition, uh, I dove in uh, and I found all of this research that highlighted the mind and the body's connection that introduced to me this new science of epi epigenetics, which is countering our old belief. Our old belief was, oh, so for me, I had the genetic chip, right, that resulted in anxiety, maybe even a diagnosis. Right, with the belief that because I have that chip, again, all I can do is manage my symptoms. We now know in the science of epigenetics that 
our lifestyle, our environments are actually playing much more of a role than these chips, these genetic components. So learning that opened up a little bit of a door for me to even entertain this idea that maybe I could change, maybe I could get better. Um, so over the course of a year, I implement, or, or multiple years, but it began with really a strict year of beginning to implement lifestyle changes. So it didn't happen overnight. I started with one thing, you know, I changed, I really looked at my nutrition. I started to connect with my body and feed my body the food that it wanted. I got my sleep in order. I started to practice some new tools to regulate my stress, including that nervous system, which I now came to realize was part of the reason why I was becoming, why I was stuck. So I spent a year regulating my body before I was able to really dive into the recesses of my mind and do what you might hear if you know my work now, reparenting and inner child work and all of that deeper stuff. Um, but my body and building that foundation of balance played a really big core piece at the beginning of my journey. And like I said, I didn't make all of the changes overnight. I actually don't suggest doing that. Um, but, you know, I implemented changes throughout my day um, over the course. And I retain, regained a balance in my body that went a long way to yeah. help me balance my mood. So it sounds like the traditional thinking is that the brain influences the body. But you're saying that there's this connection. It's they're, they're deeply connected. So you're feeling anxious and you thought this is the your destiny in life because this is the genetic chip that you were mm -hmm. given. So you started to take care of the things that you put inside your body, the nutrition, the food that you ate, basically. You started to monitor your sleep and to try to develop better sleeping patterns. I think uh, I saw or you mentioned this before about fitness and exercise and things like that. So did that then send a different signal to your brain? And how did that rewire like this anxiety? Yeah, so what that began to do is resolve the imbalances, which were causing some of the symptoms of anxiety, of nervousness, of hypervigilance. Um, you know, when my body was getting the nutrients it needed, we now know, and this is another big piece that was left out of our, our programming, these neurotransmitters, words that we might have heard of associated with, you know, our mental illnesses or diagnoses, serotonin, dopamine, right? If I have too much, too little, you know, I start to suffer, suffer symptoms. We now know, we thought that most of those were just produced and were, were housed mainly in our brain. We now know that many more are produced in our, in our gut, actually, in our stomach, right? So, I mean, right there is evidence that here's the brain chemicals that we so much, you know, we universally know them as, aren't just in our brain. So that to me, right, that means that the food that I'm eating and how healthy my gut is, is really gonna impact. So as my gut, my gut got healthier, um, so then did the production of these neurotransmitters, which just alleviated my mood. A big piece, and this is why I talk a lot about trauma and an expanded definition of trauma, because a lot of us are living with that, with a hyperactive nervous system. So as I began to engage in, you know, nervous system regulatory techniques, like for me, it was breath work was my go-to one, because it's something I could do every day consistently. Now my nervous system was actually going into that more balanced state. So that's when my hypervigilance, that's a symptom when I'm feeling like I'm waiting for the next shoe to drop all the time and I feel jumpy. That's actually a symptom of our nervous system being dysregulated. So as I began to use those tools that my nervous system regulated itself, away went those symptoms, right? So before I knew it, the symptom, what I was coming to realize is these symptoms that I was calling anxiety were really symptoms of this dysregulation that I was living my entire life. Wow. Okay. I have things that I, I want to try out already. But when you talk about nutrition, is it the things that we kind of commonly know that you should eat less sugar, carbs, red meat? That so I for, 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 for nutrition, I mean, I, I am never, you're never going to hear me talk in terms of um, a universal one size fits all, you know, dietary plan. You'll hear me speak more about connecting to your own internal intuitive body's wisdom and allowing your body to tell you when it's hungry, when it's full, monitoring how you feel after you eat and allowing that to guide your decisions. Now, that might sound simple as I'm just kind of voicing that right now in real time. However, there's a lot behind the scenes that goes along with that. I have to be connected to my body. I have to be able to tune in to those signals and know what they are and respond to them. The reality for a lot of us is we're eating for many other reasons than what our body wants and what our body needs. So 
it's much more of a process reconnecting. Um, so that could result in a different diet, you know, at the end of your journey than with someone else. So what I'm attuned to is my body. Mm. When I wake up, you know, when does it become hungry? What is, and I, this might sound crazy, but what does it feel like it wants to eat? You know, and the more we can become attuned with that, the better we can be. I also believe and know that there are some foods that are universally. So the thing that we're most interested in when we talk about the gut is decreasing the foods that are causing damage. Essentially what, they, what happens is we little holes are poked in our gut lining. Um, and that allows toxins and allow, it's called leaky gut for anyone who is interested. Okay. So there are some universal foods that we want to monitor the amount that we're eating right? Such as the highly processed foods, any, any food that was in a lab that our body can't identify, chances are, it's probably going to cause a damage to our gut because our human gut doesn't under know what that is. It doesn't know what chemicals are. Um, so again, there are some things that we want to just watch the amount. And I say things like that, especially those of us that live in cities, we're met with highly processed food at the corner store all of the time. Um, so just it's awareness because the more damaging food we're putting into our gut, and I know this was a big part of my problem, the more I was causing, I didn't even know that I was doing this. I was, I'm causing that gut damage. So tuning into yourself and, and you will know, cause I now know when I eat food and I still do every now and again, you know, gluten is something that I don't tolerate very well. I love gluten every now and again, I'll eat it. And then I know now how my body reacts to gluten. I feel a little lethargic. I get a little pimples, right? So now I just allow that to dictate my next choice around gluten, which I'll be honest, Chris, sometimes I eat gluten and I saddle up for my, my irritability and my pimples, right? But at least I'm doing it consciously. So when I talk about nutrition, what I'm really just intending people to do is have awareness that our nutrition does affect our mind because again, those chemicals, that two-way street, and just to urge us to rebuild that connection back to our body and to listen ultimately to our body's wisdom because it will never guide you wrong. I feel like I could probably use the entire time that we have together to keep diving deeper and deeper. <laughs> but I have a stack of questions I do want to ask them. So uh, I, I beg our audience for forgiveness. <laughs> of on, okay, so here we go. The, the question I want to talk to you about is I saw one of your videos, you talked about the future self journal and what you could do. Can you explain this concept to us? Yeah, absolutely. So the future self journal is really harnessing the power to create change that I now know, like I was referencing earlier, is, is so possible. So the reason why we're, many of us are stuck lives in the part of our brain that I'm always going on and on about, part of our mind, which is called the subconscious, mm -hmm. right? And we, so using the computer analogy that so many of us are, are, are know and are so very fond of, right? We have these programs that are stored in this subconscious that essentially run our day for us. Everything from my daily habits of how to human, you know, what do I do first thing when I wake up? How do I brush my teeth? How do I drive my car to get into work? I mean, the list goes on to our more interpersonal programs. How do I show up in relationships? How do I navigate these things called emotions? All of that is stored in this deeper brain area that's called our subconscious. Most standard example we all we all can relate to. I'm driving that car home, right? And I'm, I'm thinking about the argument I just had with my boss and whoop, I just arrived at home and I don't really remember my drive home. How did I get home alive? Oh, thank God, my subconscious drove me home. So that's the prime example of the subconscious. The reason why we can't change lives in that subconscious because 95% of our day, unbeknownst to most of us, we're allowing that autopilot to dictate what we're doing with our day, which is why it feels very Groundhog Day. Like I was saying earlier, we tend to be very habitual and live very habitually. So the Future Self Journal is a technique that I came up with when I was starting to question or when I was starting to first realize the power of this subconscious and really starting to you know, engage with the idea of changing it. So what the journal is, it's a daily practice that I began for myself before I put templates together and you know, shared it with the world, where every morning, very early on in my journey, I would use, I, I never was a journaler even, so this was all new for me, but I used the power of writing an intention to change each and every day. So every day I wrote and I wrote as if whatever change I wanted to see in my life was already the case. And what I started to realize was that two, one of two things are really powerful in that process. The first one is 
the simple act of intending to do something different. So I did my journaling in the morning, set me up throughout that day to keep that a little bit closer to the top of mind so that I might actually make that new choice later in my day to avoid going slipping right from awake to autopilot. Because autopilot isn't going to make a new choice. Even if logically I've already come to terms with the fact that I need to change in this area, right? Autopilot is going to do what autopilot has always done. So the act of writing new and intention every morning for me really helped increase the likelihood that I would begin to practice this new habit. Also very sneakily, writing as if it's already true was harnessing a reality of our mind, which is it does not know the difference between what is real and what is imagined. So the act of writing in present tense as if this change already happened, right? So for instance, I spent a lot of time being dissociated, disconnected. So I spent a lot of time journaling every morning about being conscious. I'm conscious, I'm aware, I'm in my body, right? I can feel sensation. That's the opposite, if you will, of dissociated. That wasn't true for me in the beginning, but as I was writing it, I'm laying down some new neural pathways. And our brain is what we refer to, probably a word many of us have heard of, neuroplastic. So it's changeable. So now I'm writing and I'm mentally rehearsing and I'm actually helping my brain form some new network. So that, in addition to the intention, the consistent daily in intention to change, now I'm creating some momentum and I'm creating a pathway of change in my actual brain, which I can harness to create actual change then in my behavior. So I, I still journal daily. Um, I change, you know, kind of the areas that I'm working with after having a lot of success in my own practice, I put together some templates and I, you know, started to talk about it online. And, you know, now I'm starting to see how powerful this of a tool is for all of us really. Mm -hmm. Do you keep saying this to yourself every single morning until it becomes the new default operating system? Pretty much so. And I, when I, when I talk about the journal, you know, you'll hear it, you'll see in my prompts, anyone who's signed up, if anyone who is interested, if you sign up for my email list, it will go right to your inbox. Um, I suggest at least 30 days. However, a lot of these new patterns take much more than 30 days. So yeah, it would be something I would, it's very repetitive, right? So every morning I would work on that one area. So for me, I spent well more than 30 days trying to become conscious, um, connect it, and I would just write it every morning and practice it every day until that became more or less my new normal, my new autopilot. And it took a very long time because it, I was dissociated for a very long time. Um, this is where patience is key. However, there's so much progress along the way, you know, where you have moments of consciousness that is incredibly motivating to keep you going. But I always say that because this isn't a magic journal. This isn't a quick fix. Right? I don't write it, close my journal, and poof, I'm now this new person. It really, it's just a tool to create that repetitive, consistent change. And it is so incredibly impactful as we harness it. Great. And we'll get the link from you later, and we'll drop it in the notes below. Absolutely. I just dropped it, Chris. Oh. All right, Ricky. <laughs> <laughs> Cut me off. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Okay. So it'll be in that you know, for people who aren't tuned in live uh, in the notes below. So you guys can sign up for Nicole's email. Now in, in that video that I saw, you had two prompts. The first prompt was I am grateful for this is part of your future self journal. And the, the second prompt was three traits of the future self dot, dot, dot. And you would write that down. And then you go and you repeat this over and over. And then eventually this becomes your new reality. I'm fascinated by this kind of stuff. Neuroscience. I'm just curious. What is the science behind that you're, you can't tell the difference between reality and what is imagined? Yeah. So, I mean, we are creating, our brain is a, it, it's an active, uh, our mind is an active process. Like we are creating and constructing. I mean, as, as trippy as this might sound for a lot of listeners, everything from the perceptions we're having in, in any moment, it's all being generated you know, from our mind with little neurons and keep it really simple, little neurons that are firing, neurons that fire together, wire together. We've all heard of those. That's what I mean when I say networks, right? So whether or not it's because I'm thinking about what I'm doing, or if I'm just sitting here thinking about what I wish I was doing, to my mind, all of the neurons are firing as if I'm doing it. And the most fascinating research is they, they've now, it's called mental rehearsal, if anyone's interested, and they've studied it really extensively. 
and they'll study it often in sports where they'll have sports, um, oftentimes basketball players, you know, foul shooting, doing uh, free throws, uh, visualizing it. And they actually even neurons in the motor, motor cortex, right? So the areas of the brain that are activated when we're actually moving, if we're envisioning that we're moving, so I'm shooting a, a shooting my hoops, shooting a basketball, those neurons are, my, my, my arm isn't moving now while I'm doing that, but the neurons are firing as if my arm is moving. So that's the power of the mind. And it really comes down to, you know, mental events that are just neuron cells that are firing and then connecting with each other. Even if it's not mapping on to my external reality in that moment, in my mind, it's alive as if it is, which is where we create change. Because when we're mentally rehearsing something that's new or that we want to be better at, right, we're just giving that network more and more practice, like at the gym. Wow, I think we just stepped into the matrix here. <laughs> it can get really trippy. <laughs> that science fiction can be real in that Neo is sitting in the chair and then he wakes up and he's like, I've learned jujitsu. Because <laughs> if you practice it in your mind, and then it's no different than actually you doing it for real, but you can do this 10,000 times in your mind anywhere. Yes, right? yes, yes. Okay. I still yes. suggest and the reality still is translating that practice to real life, you know, because for a lot of us, we have fears wrapped up in this, like, oh, if I show up in this new way, what'll happen? So it's obviously much more complicated than just visualize something and then it happens. Um, it gets much more psychologically complicated, but doing that mental practice will help set us up to achieve then that success in real life. Mm -hmm. There's this thing that happens a lot within the creative community where we, we want to explore lots of new, crazy, cool, interesting things. We want to make a video. We want to start an Instagram account. We want to go and give a talk or something like that. And that intention, they say out loud, like, yeah, I want to do this. But then there's no follow through with the action. And I, I feel like people are suffering from this uh, paralysis by analysis, this uh, fear of making mistakes. How could we apply some of the concepts you just talked about to help them get over this? Because I think if more creative people just were able to put into action what they were thinking, it would be a better place. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think a lot of times we become paralyzed through analysis because many of us attempt so desperately to, so I'm gonna say solve our problems or whatever it is, right? It, from our mind, right? And the reality of it is we could really paint ourselves into a corner because I can make a really elaborate argument for and against the same thing that I'm considering. And that's how we become paralyzed because we're listening to our mind and trying to weigh like a court case, right? Evidence in favor and whatever side wins, right? That's what I'm going to pick to do. Sometimes we even factor in our friends or our loved ones opinions into our court case, into our, you know, into our jury box to decide. The reality of it is we all have a space from which our best decisions come that it's not actually coming from our mind at all. It's coming from our deeper, more intuitive, you know, kind of guttural center um, that many of us have lost touch with. So a first step, you know, is really starting to de decrease the overall amount of time we're spending in our minds or the amount of time we're using our mind, you know, our thinking to determine our course of action and beginning to spend, again, this is a process, more and more time dropped into our bodies because our body is going to be the speaker. That's where the wisdom that I'm speaking of, of the intuition, our, you know, our deepest knowledge and knowing comes from. So the reality is we feel our way into our best decisions, our best creative projects, less than we think our way. So the first tool is stop relying on our mind. This is for anything, anything we're creating, any decision about the partner we, you know, that is the best for us or our course in life you know, really trying to drop into that intuitive, intuitive space. And then, you know, there's a lot of other reasons. A lot of us have a, a, a sense of not being worthy. You know, a lot of us are responding to maybe real wounds, especially artists. You know, did we come from environments that fostered our creativity or were we given messages that were, you know, anti it or, you know, create whatever it is. A lot of us have narratives about ourselves or our creation or our place in the world that's not always conducive to putting out our work so if you're someone like that you know again it's doing that deeper work it's unconditioning ourselves from operating under those beliefs that might have been real for us at a time and a place and maybe painful for us at a time and a place but you know allowing us to create a future that's different that we can be confident in ourselves and our work and then walking through the fear 
that comes with putting out anything, you know, as a creative, I understand this. Every time I put out a post, it's like, oh, you know, like it feels like you're really being vulnerable and opening yourself up to feedback. And nothing teaches, in my opinion, like the wisdom of doing something uncomfortable. So, you know, we, we, we work us, we understand, we connect into our body to use that for our guidance. And it still might be uncomfortable. And we still might feel vulnerable when we put our work out there. And then it's just about doing it and doing it and doing it and getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. That was just the nicest, uh, most professional way of saying, shut up and just do it. And I love that. <laughs> I like it. So you heard it from Dr. Nicole LaPera. And, and you can listen to the whole part or you can just do it because yeah. you can talk about it. You can think about it all you want, but nothing teaches like experience and then yes. reflecting on that experience. Right. And yeah. you're and I and I share this, too, from my own lived experience. So I will always if you follow me long enough, you'll probably hear about the scary thing that I did last week that I didn't want to do and that maybe you even showed up to see me do. So I live this as well. There's still things that scare me. Um, and I'm not just saying this for my high horse that I don't, oh, just, just do it. You know, I know how it is to be scared and to walk through that discomfort. And like I said, I've also learned that doing that, I get to refute all of the imagined scenarios that I've come up with that are definitely going to be what happens. More often than not, that's not what happens at all. You're, we are often pleasantly surprised. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, the world is not as bad as we dream it <laughs> or fear to be. So, I, I think I heard you say this that the emotional part of you is making more of the decisions than the logical part of you than you think. If I heard that correctly, so there's things that I'm wrestling with that I'm trying to weigh in the, the jury box of my mind, but we have to be more in tune with what our emotions are telling us and then listen to that. But here's the question here, if that, if that is true, if what I heard what you say is true, is a lot of times creatives get into this, these disagreements with their clients. And they think they're going to make this logical appeal, like it's better, it's more legible, it's these are the new colors, and then they're not understanding the emotional concerns of the other person. Can you help us to kind of navigate that a little bit, knowing what you know? Yeah, I, you know, any communication is so interesting, and you'll you'll always hear me hear me acknowledge this because again, this is I think a little counterintuitive to what most of us think. When we have a, a messenger and receiver of the message. I will always, you know, kind of attest to the most power in that dyad and that two person exchange is held by the listener, right? Yes, the speaker can do several things that I can, you know, offer here, especially when we have difficult conversations that can increase the likelihood of the receiver hearing the message. However, it is the receiver hearing the message or not that's going to make or break the communication, right? And I say this because anytime our emotions are touched or we're emotional, right, chances are we're not going to be receptive to hearing. So anytime a we have to have a hard conversation, a professional conversation, address maybe something that we can anticipate our client isn't going to be interested in, you know, if we can do so at as de-escalated of a time, as less stressful of a time as possible. So not when I'm arguing with that same client about something else is probably not the time to bring up this other issue. So being as calm and as grounded for both parties, right? So even if you're intending you as the professional, like I have to deliver this message to my client. If I call up my client to deliver that message and I'm hearing the terrible day that my client is having, maybe tomorrow is a better time to have this difficult conversation because it also applies to the listener. Because when the listener is emotional, chances are they're gonna be shut down. So timing is something that I suggest we all play with. And being as balanced of a place as possible will increase the likelihood that it will not become emotional and shut down the conversation. Mm -hmm. Language can also, is my next suggestion, can really be harnessed. And the language I'm talking about, or that I'm of, often talking about and offering is what I call objective language. Not always what we lead with, especially if it's a difficult conversation. More often than not, we lead with you-based language. So you don't know what you're talking about. I'm the professional here. I know the right colors. You, I mean, I'm just pretending, right? But you, right, so you just made a gesture. Right? Anytime the listener hears you in a negative tone, they don't really care about what you're going to say next. What mm -hmm. they're going to do is shift into defensiveness to defend themselves against what they're perceiving as an attack. Right. So this is a, a language skill that we can teach ourselves that might not be intuitive, breaking out of that habit of accusatory sounding language, 
this might take practice, right? If you do have to have a hard conversation with a, a more difficult client, maybe writing up like the three points in an objective way that you want to relay this message. Sometimes that can be the difference shifting from accusatory kind of more threat based languaging to something that's a bit more objective can allow the person to hear um, and not become so emotional. So timing and really harnessing language um, can help these conversations, especially professionally, go a long way. I find that people have a harder time listening if they feel attacked and if they're not feeling safe. Yeah. So you yeah. got to you got to you got to let them know I care about you, that this is a safe place. And like you said, if this is not the right time, don't have that conversation. But there's things that you can say that will trigger it. What, what doesn't seem like it is to you, but to the other to the receiver is an attack. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that I mean, the illustration there is that we're all different, you know, so you might be surprised, you know, that that is that that the receiver is taking an issue to what you're saying, because you wouldn't have an issue with it said that way. Mm -hmm. Right. And we're all leading from our experience first and foremost. So it really is understanding. And this is general life, whether we're having a conversation with someone professionally or personally, we have to make room, I say, become flexible for the reality that we all have different realities, that we all have different past experiences and that we're, we can all then perceive the same event in multiply different ways. Right. Okay. Hard shift, hard shift. This is something I struggle with and continue to struggle with today. You talk about boundaries, how to set them. And I think you, in that video, you talk about create state and maintain. Can you help us to establish better boundaries? Yeah, absolutely. So I come from a, what, I, what we call a codependent and meshed, essentially a boundaryless family household. Um, so I struggle. I had no boundaries. So boundaries, I had no idea what they were. Essentially what a boundary is, it's, it's a, a, a line of separation or a limit, right? Between me and you, right? You know, where I can be a separate individual. Um, we have boundaries around our physical space, which differs, you know, how much space do I like around my person? Do I like to be touched? Do, do I not like to be touched? Mm -hmm. We have emotional boundaries, which is really simply, right? I, all of my emotions are valid and separate from your emotions. I can have space and I can allow for people in my world, even if I love them, having different emotional states or different emotional reactions at one time. This is contrasted from my family where one emotion took over the whole household. Stress was the number one emotion in my household, meaning if one person was stressed, before we know it, we were all stressed. There, was not, there wasn't that space, right, for mom to be having a stress day and no, not everyone else to be impacted. Um, there are, there are spiritual, there's just many different types of that separation. So first and foremost, we want to identify where we need to tighten our boundaries. So for me, I needed to create new boundaries in a lot of my relationships. This is an individual process because boundaries are for us, right? My limits might look different than the person with whom I'm in a relationship that I might be replacing the limit. They might be experiencing this relationship differently than myself. So I go inward and I explore the changes I need to make for myself, right? Then I create, I decide the areas, what I need to happen a little less or happen a little more in these relationships. So I create a boundary, you know, I kind of enact it. I say, okay, this is actually going to be a change that happens. This part I really want to highlight is focusing on me changing, not the person, the other, the other in the relationship it's what am I going to do differently? Now, the other, right? So for instance, one of my boundaries, I was always felt I was on call in my family, being the doctor of the family. Anytime something happened, right? Nicole got a phone call. And I came to the realization that there was this frequency of something happening was a bit much for me. And I was starting to feel overwhelmed, right? So I wanted to be a little less involved in those calls. So as opposed to saying, my sister oftentimes was the caller, as opposed to saying, you know, sister, stop calling me, right? I said, I am going to change. So I acknowledge that I was not going to be that available, meaning my sister might still call me, but I very directly told her that I would need to, I would call her back, right? When I felt ready to have that conversation. So I just use that as an illustrated illustration because boundaries are for us. They're not pointing the finger and asking someone else to do something different. They are saying, okay, someone else, if you continue to do the same thing that you've always done, which likely you will, then I'm going to do this new thing this time. So they're for us to create change in our relationships. 
So then you put them up and then the, the final step, maintaining them might be the most difficult step for some of us because I know what I became plagued with when I started to show up differently and put limits in my relationships. I got a case of the feel bads, as I call them, which I am plagued with. I would feel so badly that I wasn't available to this person as I are always had historically been that I would almost guilt myself internally. Now, the person might not even have anything awareness that this is happening for me. I might often even guilt myself into or be compelled to take that boundary right down. So it's defining these new limits, enacting these new limits, which could be very uncomfortable because we're violating expectations. The person is used to experiencing us in this old way and then maintaining them, even if there's kickback on the other side, even if there isn't kickback and it's only in my head and they go a long way. So my rally cry for all things boundaries is as uncomfortable as boundaries are for many of us when we're beginning to practice them as I know they were for me. So walking through that internal, dis that initial discomfort right, often leads us to a relationship that's so much more sustainable and fulfilling on the other end. So it's not to say this is going to be easy, but it's, in my opinion, incredibly worth it because any other path often, we keep showing up in our relationships in a way that doesn't work for us or doesn't honor ourselves. What happens over time, we become so incredibly resentful of the relationship itself and or of the other person. And we get mad at you instead of saying, wait a minute, what have I not done for myself along the way? Mm -hmm. I think so many of us are hardwired to be people pleasers. We want to make our partners happy, uh, our children happy, our business partners happy, and our clients happy. And I think we volunteer to become, uh, well, we volunteer to play all these roles and to extend and erode all of our boundaries and to a certain point, like you said, become really resentful. And one of the things that you talked about was these are things hey jonah <laughs> i gotta hear you talking okay so one of the things that happens a lot with creative people is they don't know about boundaries they don't set them at the beginning they definitely don't maintain them and the minute that they feel that guilt self it just gets all torn down yeah. and so here's a typical scenario a client wants to talk to you all the time Okay, and they want to call you on a Friday night at 7 p.m. They want to call you on a Sunday and say, where's my files? And I think we're quick to jump to action to like get right on it. So can you just take what you just said and apply it to this very specific thing? I know it's going to sound very similar, but I'm trying to connect the dots for our audience. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll speak from my own past experience. So not as a creative, but as a practitioner in a private practice, right? So what I just did and decided for myself was the hours I was in practice for per se, right? So for me, you know, it was obviously all the hours that I was in with clients, you know, and then I had hours built around there where I was available for emails, for texts, for any communication. I also had hours where I wasn't available, you know? So for me, just given my schedule, you know, maybe it was like Sunday or Saturday, Sunday, or Monday, my days I was off, right? And I would protect that where I would, be very direct with my air, my hours of availability. So meaning right from the jump, my clients knew that if they texted me, say after 9 p.m., that they wouldn't get a response from me until 9 a.m. the next morning, right? Or if they texted me over the weekend that maybe they wouldn't get, right? So sometimes it's about carving out work times versus non-work time. So, and then you just kind of objectively, directly state in the beginning, you know, that you're not available 24 seven. And then it's about honoring that for yourself. So when you can't, and you know, you can't force the person to honor that you might still get that email at midnight or on that Saturday that you're not technically working. And then it's your job to manage that internal guilt right, and that compulsion to respond. So if you can carve out, you know, actually boundary times around work, um, for yourself, then I think that will will go a long way. And it might just be overnight. I mean, again, I think everyone works differently, has different flows. So honoring yourself, you know, being available when you're in flow and realizing that it's okay to be not available that and being not available actually goes a long way, in my opinion, to helping flow on the other side, we can't be on all the time, right? You, you, let's just say you have established in a very objective language the boundaries of how to work with you and there's unreasonable people and they just 
they escalate and escalate until a point in which it becomes a giant issue. How do you respond then? Because this has happened to me in my professional life early on, uh, pre-smartphones uh, and, and, and all the technology that we have today. My client insisted that I buy a pager so that she could page me at a drop of a dime no matter where I was and I had to call her back and I refused to do this and she became livid. And, and ultimately, here's how she, she enacted her revenge on us. After we finished and delivered our work, she didn't pay us. Like, great. Wow, yeah, that's tough. Oh, how, do you, I, how do you deal with like those really tough, prickly personalities? Yeah, it's hard. I mean, you can't anticipate that. You know, sometimes you can expect it, sometimes you can't. The best we can do is just stay true to ourselves, honor ourselves. You know, if the root, and I don't know the ins and outs of, of your profession, but the reality of it is not, not all working relationships work. Not all clients are the clients that are going to be happy within the working relationship. Something I was really aware of in my old practice was, and they've studied this, the most important factor of whether or not therapy, quote unquote, was going to work, quote unquote, was not all of the tools, it was the relationship, right? And that doesn't mean that every client that vetted me or that thought they wanted to work with me that came through my door was a good fit. Um, so sometimes it really means, you know, kind of learning and how to vet those people with whom we more comfortably work um, versus those with whom we can't. Now, of course, there's always, you know, oh, I didn't expect this person to turn into this, you know, when stress erupted, the unexpected, but we can also get better and better at identifying these kind of red flag markers earlier and earlier on. And then obviously, I don't know everyone's, you know, financial. And sometimes we make decisions for our financial security or insecurity, you know, that are that counter maybe our best interests. So of course I know it's much more complicated. And sometimes we need the money and we have to work. Right. Um, but you know, our goal would be to more and more over time, you know, work more and more in alignment with the people that are more and more in alignment, that we don't necessarily have to take on any of the clients that might turn into that nightmare in the end. Right. It's like the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. You all, you don't always know and you can't predict it, but if you tune into the, the your body, maybe your gut, your emotions, yeah. things, you're, you, you actually know. You really yeah. know. Because every time I have a bad client, I think back like, you know, when they said that and I pretended yeah. to hear that or pick up that signal. Yeah. Yes. For that price now i'm not mad at them i'm mad at myself yeah Pay yeah and that's that's the bottom line and if we tune in i love that you you use that example chris because if we tune in those those signs are there i know so many uh, that that wording of the thing or that you know message that you sent me it's just like i saw and a lot of times we are doing that in all aspects of life outside of business we're overriding ourselves we're overriding ourselves we hear the we hear our intuition pinging and we're convincing ourselves otherwise. So like I said, I know sometimes it's more complicated. I've had to make decisions to keep food on the table and, you know, well, I have to have this practice. I have, this has to be the case. So a lot of times we're factoring in a, a lot of components. However, our intuition is always, is always there pinging. Mm. Okay. I want to share one little thing and then I ask you another question here for our audience who are listening to this. Like what are the practical applications of this? One thing that Nicole was saying is just slow down your response a little bit because your need to respond to something actually increases the frequency in which people are going to ask you for things and it's going to just get faster and faster until it becomes unbearable, tainting and poisoning your own relationship by your own doing. So my designers, when I, when I give them something to do and or the client gives them something to do. I just say, just sit on it and mm -hmm. gather it all up together until the time in which you're supposed to respond and then do the work all at once versus responding to every single thing. Sometimes we forget we're not working in a fast food restaurant where every order that comes in has to be filled as fast as possible. Just slow that process down a little bit. Okay. Next big question. And I think you, you've already kind of talked about this a little bit, which is this is how do we create new habits? Yeah create new habits, one small promise at a time. So what do I mean by that? Back to this subconscious, right? The reality of it is, like I said, that's why we're stuck. Our subconscious is creating the programs and logically when we wanna do something new, right? Our, it's going to feel unfamiliar to us because it is unfamiliar to us. So what I mean when I say one small daily promise is a lot of us are tempted to wanna change our life from top to bottom, you know, in one fell swoop. You know, maybe logically we know five areas that we do really want to change. I don't suggest doing making those five areas of change overnight because that subconscious will feel overwhelmed. One new thing is overwhelming enough for it and it's going to feel uncomfortable enough, let alone five new things. 
And remember that sneaky word that I keep offering, which is consistency. You know, we don't create habits by white knuckling, you know, five new things for five days in a row. We create habits by doing one thing for multiple days in a row. So how we create a new habit is we, we pick one small area, the most inspiring story that I'm always talking about. And I'm always shouting you out, Allie, because we have a community member who after coming to realize that she was stuck in a ha- in self betrayal, which is what I call habit self, living that Groundhog's Day, you know, not living the life that she wanted in any area of her life, really. So she probably had a list of five things she wanted to change when she started. Instead, what she did was made a small daily promise to drink one glass of water when she woke up. That was it. And Ailey started and kept that promise more days than she did it by drinking one small glass of water. Now she's a year plus, I forget when I, when she joined the community into her healing journey, she has added so many, you know, new habits that began with that one small promise. So how do we create change? You know, we find the areas that we want to do something different in and we pick one of them where it's so small, we can almost roll our eyes and say, what is a glass of water really going to even do? And we hold ourselves accountable to that one promise. And then that glass of water, if you're someone like Allie, could turn into a new lease on life in so many ways, new relationship opportunities, new ways she's experiencing herself. I mean, so incredible. So we start small is a simple way um, to answer that because habits really do create consistency and they're going to be uncomfortable at first because it's not our familiar. Mm -hmm. What does that do for you when you drink that glass of water every day and then you add a new thing and then you add a new thing? What does that tell your body or your mind? I think it empowers you. It allows you for many of us for the first time to experience keeping your word to yourself, which in my opinion is personal empowerment, which is why I say it it really is really doesn't matter what the promise is. It's the act of keeping it because I know for me, I didn't keep promises to myself. I wasn't modeled that. Um, I pretty much lived in my zone of comfort, that autopilot my whole life. I didn't do new things because if I, thought to do a new thing. And if I attempted to do a new thing, I, like most of us felt uncomfortable. It didn't feel right. So I scurried right back into my comfort zone. And what I did in the process of that was I, what I call, I betrayed myself. I didn't keep my promise. I didn't show up for myself. I didn't change. I feel maybe shameful about it. What's wrong with me that I didn't do this. So it doesn't matter what the promise is. It's the act of showing up for yourself of keeping yourself in count accountable that empowers you to keep creating those changes. Mm. So doing that, are you then telling yourself a different story about who you are and what you're capable of? Yeah, by proxy, I mean, you can start telling my story, you know, began from all of the things I wasn't capable of because of all of the reasons why some of it genetics, some of it, my personality, right? As I kept more and more promises, I became, I internalized the belief, I came to believe that I was actually capable of quite more than I believed myself to be. And then as I added changes and changes and changes, I actually broke down so many of those constrictions that I had in place for myself because I started to live differently. I started to look differently. I started to act differently. So this, you know, uh, this chip wasn't controlling me anymore. I was controlling me. And that's why empowerment, I'm always saying that word empowerment and choice and change that's what this is about is, is empowering ourselves to create change. It doesn't matter what change the change is, um, but just showing ourselves that we can. Mm-hmm. Do you think that somebody who doesn't want to change or who might not be ready to change can try this technique and have success or do they have to start to want it for themselves first? I, I think change, I actually just filmed a video this weekend, Chris, where uh, I, I take questions and answers. And so I, I get a lot of times, you know, how do I get insert whomever, boyfriend, partner, sister, mom to change. Right. Um, and my answer is always the same. You can't is that healing is, is really a personally chosen journey um, because it takes that personal commitment. It takes us incorporating these habits and showing up for ourselves day in and day out. So yeah, other people around us can inspire change. You know, one of the most impactful things, if you're someone who is listening and who is out there and who deems whatever your love, whomever your loved one is not ready or not able to change, all hope isn't lost. Um, So much can happen if you focus internally on your own healing. Um, One of two things happen. The first being 
the issues that were causing us to want this person to change are no longer as problematic because we're showing up differently or because we're dealing with it in a new way. So we don't, over time, we might surprise ourselves that we don't actually necessitate that person changing anymore. And or another beautiful thing happens. Sometimes we can inspire change because those around us that love us, as they start to see and experience us differently and you know us maybe walking into this future that we're now creating for ourselves, that could inspire that person to deem them worthy or to find it important for them to change. But without the personal commitment, you know, and a lot of us try, a lot of us point the finger and want so badly for someone to be or do differently um, and get really frustrated and feel really powerless when we come to realize that that's just not possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you can stop. And uh, we've received so much value. And I have to say for everybody that's watched this channel before, this is not scripted. This was not pre-planned. Nicole's just sharing what she thinks and feels. And you're going to see there's a lot of alignment here. She's, of course, doing it in a much more loving, generous, nice, nurturing way than we normally do on our channel. But that's why we bring guests like her on the show. <laughs> okay. So I have a question for you. Here's, here's like the last big question, I think. I think if I can envision like what happens inside my head, Maybe there are a couple of people inside of my head. And every time I look at an opportunity or a decision I have to make, those voices, those people in my head, they have a debate and they argue. Like you said, the jury is kind of trying to figure out what we need to do. And oftentimes we might call one of those voices ego. I don't know if I understand that correctly, but the question for you is this, is, is ego always, or not always, does ego drive us to make the wrong decision sometimes? Is ego the enemy, as some people say? Yeah, no, um, I actually think there's a lot of misinformation. Ego gets a really bad rap. It does. Um, so a couple myths to debunk. We all have one. Um, and it's not actually a lot of times we think universally, we think of ego, and we associate words like narcissist or like egocentric, like, oh, I'm so great, holier than thou. That's not actually what ego is, is at all. Mm -hmm. um, ego, it actually has a, a protective function, um, there, thereby why we all have one. Um, and just keep it really quite simply, it's, it's the story of us, you know, based on all of our past experiences, it's who we come to think of and experience ourselves as being. That is as simple as what it is. So our goal isn't to kill it, to, to you know, imagine a life without it. Our goal is to remove its power because most of us are reacting solely from that ego page place, believing only part of the story of us, because that's what ego is. It's only part of who we are for them. And it might even be giving us stories about ourselves that are actually in opposition to who we are. So what the goal is, is to give it less and less power so that the self that is us, this authentic self or right, the person who can observe the ego and its voice, right, that other thing, that elusive being that is actually the one who holds the power our goal with ego is to give that being the power back. So our ego stories are going to be there, you know, for many of us, you know, throughout our day, I know mine are, but what my goal is to observe my ego, say, okay, ego, thank you for, you know, offering that explanation for what's going on right now as, as well, as well with that very loving option for what to do next. However, I'm going to show up and I'm going to do differently. So it's not killing it. It's learning how to integrate it is what I say, or live with it and not allow that to be the dictator. How can I identify the traits of ego and recognize it when it happens so that I can pay attention to the, the, in the entire story and not just one of the stories? Yeah, listen, you know, I, I'm always talking about um, developing a habit of self-observation or the ability to see, observe, explore our internal world. What you'll come to find as you do that is like there's a voice up there talking all day long. So listen, listen to the stories it's telling you. They're probably very repetitive. There's probably a whole narrative framework in there. Definitely it. So listen all day. Definitely listen when we're feeling emotionally activated or when we're triggered, if you will, right? Because I know those are the times where I get my greatest lesson um, because in those moments, you know, I am seeing stories for me that really highlight my wounds and, and my ego and all of the stories that I developed in protection. So when I'm feeling really upset is a great time, not to mean that life can't upset me naturally, but it's the repetitiveness of the upset. So I came to find several themes in the things that upset me all day long, 
right? How can that many things, how can all roads lead to one of my ego stories is I'm not considered. This comes from childhood, being raised with an emotionally unavailable mother, right? In a very real way, not feeling that she was present to me to quote unquote, consider me. What I came to find Chris when I did some looking is, oh, I could make the light not being turned off in my apartment and evidence of me not being considered, right? So I was painting all of these experiences of me not being considered into really unsuspecting situations. So for me, I came to realize that was an ego story because if I can protect myself from someone who won't consider me or doesn't consider me, right? This is where protection comes in. I don't have to feel vulnerable and hurt by them. But what I had to call into question was the sheer amount of things and people that aren't considering me in my life, which gave me a little indication that there was a deeper story here. Um, that logically, objectively, I don't think all of these were moments of these humans not, quote unquote, considering me as I assigned the meaning. Um, and that's when I came to realize. So for me, that's one of my biggest ego stories of protection is, okay, you don't want to consider me? Well, screw you. I'm going to keep myself safe over here. Whew. Ricky, Jonah, I I'm sure we have a thousand questions. Maybe we can ask uh, Dr. Nicola Para maybe one or two questions and then we... We've taken up too much of her time. Um, Wesley, so a therapist, Wesley, Wesley yeah, Wesley. She, she asked a question earlier, um, and she just wanted to, she just wanted to thank you for being on the show. She's a big fan, but she also wanted to ask how you deal with being so responsive when you've amassed an audience and trying to, uh, what, Jonah, help me out? Is that, oh, is that it? I think that's, that's a good enough question. That's a good question. So did you, did you understand the question, Nicole? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, so in the beginning, it was really, I made that promise to myself, like I was saying earlier, that I would respond to everyone. Um, obviously over time, it got, it got impossible to do that. Um, so for me, it was difficult internally. I had a lot of feel bads. Still, I was actually talking yesterday with my partner um, about, you know, just the sheer mass of emails and how I wanted to personally be able to respond to everyone and how I just am starting to realize and honor my own limits in a new way. So the short answer is, uh, I had a, you know, kind of define for myself boundaries in terms of my responsiveness, you know, the, the, the ones I would respond to versus not. Um, and I had to hold myself accountable to that because at this point, um, it really can be endless. You know, I would be online morning, noon, and night responding to people. Um, but internally, it, it, it's difficult for me. Those feel bads creep up. Um, but I've kind of resigned myself to the impossibility of answering to everyone um, and really trying. And I'm still working on defining those boundaries for myself in terms of the engagement, how to engage around certain things. Um, so it's a work in progress, but yeah, it gets more difficult and it gets into a place of impossibility um, once some, once the population grows. Mm -hmm. Do we have another question, Ricky? Um, we don't. There's just a lot of positive comments and a lot of people are, are really glad that she's on. So, Okay. Good. Very good. Well, thank you. <laughs> now, did I understand before we went on air that you, you're not doing your practice anymore or you still are? So yeah, I'm currently, uh, well, left the practice, um, started to do virtual one-on-one -on -one work, and now I'm doing the membership mainly. I'm writing a book, um, so I'm quite busy with that. In the future, I'm going to be putting out uh, courses, and I'm actually going to adapt the membership for practitioners. So now my focus is on, I think, kind of putting the work out there in the more virtual realm um, so that more and more people can begin to do the journey of self-healing wherever they are in the world. So the short of it is I do not do that one-on-one -on -one work anymore. Mm -hmm. And where's the best place for people to find out more information about you or to find out about your program? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm always just shouting out the Instagram as my main hub because pretty much anything that I'm up to, I run through there at some point. I also have a nice link tree set up so that future self journal prompt that I was talking about at the beginning can be found in that link tree. Um, anytime I put a YouTube video up, because I do have a YouTube channel, they get released on Sundays. All of that really is filtered through the Instagram. So anyone who's on Instagram can come follow along the journey and actually connect with the community because we have some incredible individuals, incredibly supportive, um, that probably can relate to somewhat of, if not all of the experiences that you're having. So come join the community and anything that I'm up to, you'll definitely hear me or see me talking about on that Instagram page. Fantastic. So you can find her on her website. Uh, let me play, let me get the slide up here at yourholisticpsychologist.com. And as she just said, 
if you want to find out more information about her, you can find her on Instagram. That's the hub, the holistic psychologist. And uh, I, uh, the other question I wanted to ask you, just last bit here, is do you have help or people helping you do this? Because then I found out you had a YouTube channel and somebody's shooting and editing. And I, I assume you have help. Please tell me you have help. I have a team now. Um, truth be told, Chris, we uh, it, it was just myself and my partner in the beginning. But no, now I have an incredible team um, that I feel like have all been gifts to the universe um, that helped me behind the scenes, especially with membership stuff. And then, yeah, once I moved out here, I was able to connect with um, a creative who I actually connected with when I was tra- visiting out here. Um, so he's who helps me with my YouTube now. So everything's getting upgraded slowly but surely. And the team is expanding. Honestly, part of the reason why... Um, So when I open up my membership and I know I have to keep the numbers, you know, in a contained amount um, and that saddens me, you know, on the one hand, because I want to be able to offer, you know, these offerings for everyone who is interested in them. But on the other hand, there are just so many people I need in place on the back end to make sure all the systems are in place. So, yeah, there's a team that will continue to expand that is helping all of this come to be. But in the beginning, it was really the blood and the sweat of myself and my partner to get us started. Amazing. Well, on behalf of everybody on our team, including Jonah, Ricky, Mark, myself, I, I, and the entire future community, I want to welcome you to Los Angeles. I wish it were under better circumstances that you can actually enjoy what we have to offer you as a city. But I'm hoping that uh, at some point in the future, uh, we can actually do this face-to-face versus virtually like this because I really connected with what you said. What, you, what you're saying really resonated with me. And I think, I think there's so many people who want to just see you kind of in the same air, the same space as them. And if you ever need any help with your video production, you know who to reach out to. We'll be here to help you, okay? Awesome. Well, I appreciate all that, Chris. And I would love to do it in person as well. So let's definitely keep connected and hoping for a future where we can all exist in humanity again soon. Yes, I'm hoping for that as well. Okay, thank you very much. Have a great day. Of course, you too. Thank you. Jonah, get us out of here. (laughs) Get us out of here. Subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. Thank you to the one billion people that, I I guess we don't have a billion people. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, come on, man. (laughs) Are we still alive? What happened? Are we still live? Yeah, we're still live. Hearing the music. (laughs) (laughs) Hello, everybody.